I'm truly excited to be here. I have had an extraordinary response in Singapore and I honestly think that your minister that I heard talk last night is an extremely impressive man who is into the environment and un understands it. Because let me tell you that it's politicians worldwide that are killing this planet. And why is that? Because they care little about the environment and in their minds it's all about the politics and the money. And that is killing our planet. When it comes to environmental issues, they put the, the environment on the back seat. We'll deal with that later. But we're running out of time. There are several issues that really distress me. The first big one is uh, deforestation. Now, human population is increasing and the whole reason that deforestation takes place is that we need to clear more land to grow more food, to graze more cattle, to build more houses. And deforestation is one of the most serious issues on the planet today. And a lot of people do not realise it, but the trees actually put out a 40 and 50 hertz signal to attract rain. And if there's not enough trees to put out those signals, it therefore doesn't attract the amount of rain that the environment is used to. And this is happening in Australia at the moment. And I've seen evidence of tens of thousands of dead birds because there's no insects to feed them. These are the things that are catching up with us now. And in my mind, environmentally, we are being given big warnings. Global warming is really the sign that humankind overstepped the line. And when I say humankind, I'm saying humans are unkind to the planet. The second big issue that I'm extremely concerned about is actually Fukushima and what it's doing to the oceans. A lot of people don't know what's happening there and I tried to get our local media, ABC media, to do a story on Fukushima and they wouldn't, wouldn't touch it because they didn't feel that the culture in Japan would be receptive to it. But we have to face the truth. They've run out of space to store the radioactive material now and they're storing it in plastic tanks and They've out, they're so out of space now that all the waste is going into the sea, all the radioactivity. Now, if you go online, you can look at absolutely hundreds of thousands of dead sea creatures from starfish to whales on the west coast of America. That is Fukushima. Now, how many of you know that the world... Uh, food supply is provided by the sea, which is 40% of our food supply, and we're killing it. The serious issue with Fukushima is that it's killing the phytoplankton in the sea. The phytoplankton is the very basis of the whole food chain. And then we have the shark fin industry attacking that food chain from the top end. It can only collapse from both ends and it, it's time that we took the bull by the horn and, and the world needs to come up with a solution to this problem because it's going to affect everyone on this planet. My third issue, and a lot of people don't know this, there is to be a rollout of 5G technology. Who is anyone familiar with this? 5G is a very vicious signal for our phones and communication. 5G is a very short signal. 4G is a very long signal. 4G is not too bad, although it can affect some people if we 
keep the phone and use it a lot too close to our heads. 5G is 10 times worse than that. It kills your pituitary gland. It affects every cell in our body. 5G, we need a, a whole movement worldwide to ban the introduction of 5G. Now, they did a test recently in The Hague. After that test, they found 227 dead birds and they witnessed ducks who are much more receptive to those sort of things than we are as humans, trying to put their heads underwater to escape the signal. The rate of cancer in this world will go up like vertical. If you have any power at all and any sway and want to start a movement, resist 5G. It will kill cells in our own body. They require repeaters all along the roads to have a, an efficient signal. Now, I urge you, get on the band. There is no more power than your power. Put it all together and make a statement, but resist 5G. Now, I've spent the world travelling for Sir David Attenborough, filming a lot of the wildlife, and I had an overview of what is happening in this earth environmentally that few people ever see. Travelling the world, you see parts here. Now, when I was in uh, Borneo, I was there for a few months filming for his Life on Earth series. When we finally took off from there, we actually flew to Singapore here. But when I looked down out of the plane on leaving Borneo, I saw all these big rafts of timber behind boats that were heading off to Japan. And that was the Borneo rainforest. And I got such a shock, it was my big wake up call as to what was happening. And I said to my business partner at the time, my God, if they keep this up, there will not be any uh, rainforest left soon. And I think they've managed to hang on to 5% because of the orangutans there. And uh, they're struggling to hang on to that. And now, the same palm oil people want to decimate Sumatra to grow more palm oil. And what I urge you people to do is to never buy palm oil products. Right? Don't prop up the industries that are dest destroying the environment. It's absolutely imperative that we do this. So uh, I'd been to other countries where plastics literally littered the beach. I couldn't believe the amount of plastics. And everyone, of course, knows what's happening with plastics in the sea. There is actually an eddy of plastic in the middle of the Pacific Ocean the size of Tasmania. And that's a worrying thing. Now, that's getting caught up in fish. They can't digest it. Birds can't digest it. It's just a very serious problem on this earth. And it's human-made. We actually have the power to control it, but we don't. Don't go and buy products in plastic bags. Whatever you do, reject them. Make the supermarket give you uh, non-toxic bags whether it be Hessian or whatever, but don't accept plastic bags. Now, could I have the first slide, please? Birds. We see them all the time. Up close, or flying overhead on epic migrations across continents. There are nearly 11,000 different bird species worldwide, each requiring a unique approach to conservation. How do we know? We look after them all. Our scientists are the leading authority on bird conservation, so we know that there are a lot of birds in trouble. But many of these birds don't just live in one place. From a bird's perspective, 
There are no borders. All they're looking for is the next safe place to rest, eat, and raise a family. But nowadays that can be hard to find. They need our help. This is why in 1922 we formed what would become the world's largest nature conservation partnership. BirdLife International now links over 120 independent national conservation organizations worldwide, united under one vision. Every day, from country to country, we work to conserve nature along every bird migration flyway. Through birds, we are taking the pulse of the planet. We're identifying and protecting over 12,000 unique sites, areas that are not just crucial for birds, but key to supporting all life, including our livelihoods. With eyes and ears on the ground around the world, our partners have the local wisdom and the scientific insight to create action. Action that has a global impact. So whether it's the scientists braving the high seas to stop seabirds being drowned on fish hooks, the young conservationists campaigning against the destruction of wetlands, or the volunteer villagers standing up for their local forests, BirdLife will be there to help. With over 120 partners, 4,000 local conservation groups, and 10 million supporters, and growing, we're showing the world that this is not just a bird. This is a movement for all life on Earth. We are bird life. Join the flock. And isn't that wonderful? And I urge you, I see among the millions of members already a whole lot more here. And we need your support to get behind the group because it, the implications of saving life on Earth is imperative. And why is that? Because I am very concerned for what my generation is passing on to you, your generation. It needs your support because what are you inheriting? You are inheriting a very dangerous situation. Most people do not realise it, but we've already lost up to 60% of all plants and animals off this earth because of human interference and I call it humankind, but I actually believe it's human unkind. It's unkind to the environment. We don't treat it very well at all. So you guys, you hop in and you do something. You be the force. You, you generate the, the support for groups like the Bird Group. Next slide, please. There was a time when people who made natural history films used to think that if you wanted real drama, you'd have to go to Africa, where there were animals, big animals like lions, and which pounced on wildebeest and elephant, which battled with one another. And then along came Jim Frazier and Denzi Klein. And they showed that you could get just as gripping a drama right from an Australian backyard. Uh, Jim, because he had extraordinary ingenuity in inventing lenses that made shots like this one possible. And then Z, because of her great and intimate knowledge of small creatures, which enabled us to know just what animals like this one were actually doing. And the world of natural history films has never been quite the same since. I believe I helped make him famous. <laughs> I've, I've had, since those early days, a long association with David, and he really is a man. And I hate to say it, but we've had a few good wines together, and he gets a little bit tipsy, and so do I, and it leads to a lot of fun. But he is an extraordinary person, both off camera and on camera. He has extraordinary knowledge, and he's just a fabulous man, and he's been one of the best supporters of what's happening on this planet of all. And um, I think I helped make him quite famous with the sort of images that I had to deliver. So, next slide, please. Next. I started off early in my life, I had a deep interest in reptiles. And 
Uh, I remember my father chastising me once. My father was the best mentor that I could ever wish to have. He really understood the world's environments and the local environment where we lived. And he abused me one day. I rolled over a log because I was always looking for snakes or lizards or something, which was my passion. And I walked away after rolling the log away and he called me back and he said, put that log back, there's creatures living under there. And he understood the environment before the word environment became common usage in the English language. And I thank him to this day for coming hard on to me and doing that. Next slide, please. Snakes are wonderful creatures. We need them just like we need birds. We need all animals on Earth because they're all part of an intricate food chain that puts the food on our tables. We can't do without snakes. You may or may not like them, but what I learned over the years, especially from those early years, they only bite you because it's their defence mechanism. I could walk up to a stake and I can grab it like that and it will turn around and bite me. But if I go up even to deadly snakes and slide my hand under it and lift it up, that is not a threat to them and they won't bite. And that's my experience when I was not much older. So we need to treat wildlife with respect. We need to treat equally plants with respect. So next slide, please. Birds have been one of my big passions in life and I understood them from a very early age and I found that I could communicate with them. Next slide. At home, this is... I've got about 58 species of birds on my small property and this is one of them and very few people ever see these finches. This is the chestnut finch and I have a flock of about 80 coming in every day to feed and I purposely feed them to help prop up the species. That's one of the expenses I've dedicated myself to and it costs a bit to buy the seed and to actually put it out there for them. I have built a special container because other birds come in and steal their food which is like a small grain finch food. And so I devised a method where they can go through uh, wire fencing and the other bigger birds can't get and steal their food source. Next slide. These are also coming to my property. These, this pair is among about uh, 40 that come in to feed every day. Some people call them nuns, but they're also called double-barred finches. Next slide. Now, I said earlier, I developed the lenses that uh, I first used, and this was the very first time it was used on David Attenborough, and it was in Queensland, in Australia. And he couldn't believe it. When this got back to the BBC, and their editing staff all saw this footage. They couldn't believe what they were looking at. And one of the ladies at the BBC office said, oh, I'm never going to Australia. They've got caterpillars there that are four feet long. <laughs> Next slide. This is the sort of shots that the lens can do. Now, originally, I, w I was faced with big problems of filming very small things and trying to keep them in context in their environment. But all the lenses produced was out of focus backgrounds and that didn't suit me. So I went along and I consulted a CSIRO physicist. This is a scientific organisation in Australia. And told him what I was trying to do and he said, forget it mate, you can't do it. And I went away thinking, well what the hell does he know? And I started playing with optics and I found a solution. You know, I've always been one to think outside the box. And I urge you to do the same thing. Nothing is possible. Don't get stuck in the scientific paradigm. If you want to go to science, 
become a quantum scientist, they're more prepared to step outside the box and look at other avenues. And it pays handsome dividends, as it did in my case. Next slide. I literally, when I discovered the optical breakthrough, I call it a breakthrough, I built this kit of lenses. I actually went and bought a lathe and started turning up and machining parts to put the concoction that I'd created together. And it's very important with wildlife to get down on the ground and show the animals from their point of view at the world, not us as the conventional method of looking down on them and filming them, that's then become something we just look at. But if you can show the world from their perspective, as budding photographers and filmmakers, whatever you want to do, that's the way to do it. And what you do when you do that, you quickly change angles. And you get different views, different perspectives, and that gives the editor a fantastic chance to piece together in whatever form is necessary for editing. And so I became an expert on editing in camera. That's what it amounted to. So I could put some of these lenses underwater. I didn't have to put a big shield around the camera. I could just lower the lens because I proofed them so that they would go underwater. Uh, the right angle ones, I didn't have to dig holes in the ground like is conventional. I could uh, put it straight on the ground and it was at ground level looking at some creature. And then uh, different lenses had different attributes and did different things, but in the main, that's what it covered. And you didn't get that gross wide angle effect. You could have a normal shot at like using a standard 50 mil lens and yet it was all in focus. Next slide. I came, because of these lenses, I came to the attention of Panavision in the United States, the big film company, and I was approached as to how the hell I did this, and I got them to sign an agreement, uh, and with legal help, I went along to them, and he asked them, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? Because in the, in the business, they couldn't come along later and say, that they knew about that and brushed me aside. So we signed an agreement and I went over there and worked with their optical experts and we came up with the Panavision Frazier lens system which has gone right through the f uh, professional film industry now. Now Steven Spielberg first used it on Jurassic Park and he made the statement, he said, I am never going on a set without the Frazier lens. James Cameron did similar things. These are big Hollywood producers. And then it, it literally went through the commercial world. It was used on a whole lot of commercials and did amazing things. Now, what's different about this is the front part of the lens swivels in two directions. So it's 360 degree swivel. Uh, instead of running to the camera with the clipboard, I could swivel the lens around and shoot the clipboard and then turn it back onto the subject that I was filming. Uh, it also rotated that way, 360 degrees. When you do that, because of the prisms to relay the image in there, uh, will twist around. On the front of the lens is an image rotator so you could dutch the camera, again, without moving the camera. Uh, or you could use the image for special effects and spin the whole image in camera. And directors literally loved it because of the versatility of what it could do. And it actually cut down filming time because of these features on it. And of course, it had extraordinary depth of field. Next slide. <coughs> I went to Sumatra uh, and had to film uh, Rafflesia, which is one of the biggest flowers in the world. Rafflesia, and it was right up in the jungle. Now, you have to really think before you 
go on a, a, a journey like this. There's no electricity up there, so you have to be prepared before you go. You have to take battery power. I needed lights. And what happens, this particular flower takes three days to open. And believe it or not, it's like rubber. You can hear it creaking apart as it opens. But in this case, when you do time-lapse uh, filming, you need to... You don't want daylight and night coming and going and coming and going through a three-day shot. So we built a big black tent over it. And you can see two lights on there. You take the shots, switch the lights on, take the shot, and everything switches off again. And I had to build all that equipment before I left, all the switching gear. And I thought, my God, if something goes wrong up there... Uh, it, it, it'll be disastrous after such an expensive trip to do this thing. And I did it for Attenborough. And uh, uh, another trick I'll tell you about in a minute. And I set up two cameras, you can see, at right angles to each other. And I thought at the time, gee, if something goes wrong with one camera, at least we could cut to the other camera if necessary. So I did that, and it was... a. Uh, fortunate decision. They had uh, they could cut to different angles, and one of the lights actually blew during the shot, and they were able to cut. Now, before they open, uh, they're like big cabbages, and uh, one of the tricks of the trade. David Attenborough was nowhere near this place, but they needed me to create a link. So I had to bend down and put my hand on it. And so they filmed David in some other jungle somewhere in the world. I don't know where it was. And he's wandering through the jungle. And he gets to and he comes to a point where he says, and one of the amazing flowers in the world is this Rafflesia. And he bent down. And it was my hand on the thing, not his. <laughs> That's the sort of tricks you have to play, and I did that several times for him. Next slide. Now, I mentioned earlier that you can attract uh, birds. Uh, if you're very friendly to birds, they, they actually know when you're not. But we actually have our eyes at the front. So birds perceive us as predators. Uh, most non-predators have their eyes at the side, okay? Whereas the predatory animals have their eyes facing forwards. So I have developed this technique. You never walk directly towards a bird because that is actually a threat. So what you do is you cover one eye. And they also perceive us as predators because we're bipedal. All right, so never walk directly, walk at a dangle, and you can zigzag your way closer and closer to them. But there is a little trick too. So to stop being bipedal, you put one foot behind, you cover one eye, and you hop along. <laughs> I'm only joking. Next slide. Now that was a wild bird. And <clears throat> If, if your intent comes from your heart and your subconscious, you can say, I am no threat to you, and you'll be surprised at the reaction you get. You can actually attract a lot of wildlife by doing that, by not presenting a threat. Next slide. This is another use of the deep focus lens where you can... Uh, put the background in focus along with the bird. Next slide. Now, this little bird I rescued, uh, I found it slightly injured on the side of the road and I took it home and it became a friend. It knew I was friendly and it responded accordingly. It used to clean my teeth every day. <laughs> At that time I smoked a pipe and that was a convenient perch for it and it, w it didn't want to leave there. And so I had to, it got a bit heavy on my teeth after a while. Next slide. 
This emu actually tried to mate with me, and this is a wild bird, <laughs> and I'm tormenting it. And I escaped just before it jumped on top of me. <laughs> Next slide. Now, this is the rifle bird, and uh, you'll see a, a sequence of this a little bit later in a clip I'll show you. Next slide. This, this is it in its display position. It's trying to attract a female. Next slide. In order to film a lot of birds, you have to get up into their territory, and that means building tree hides. Tree hides are, are an absolute necessary thing. You need to be concealed. You don't want to be a threat to the bird, especially if you're near their nest. They become worried and disconcerted with your... Uh, presence. Next slide. Now that long dead stump there on the right is the perch that the uh, rifle bird sat on and that's the hide concealed in the trees there. Next slide. This is building another hide in another location. You literally have to get into the trees. Uh, and, and enter their territory. Next slide. Climbing rope ladders is really, really hard work, let me tell you. Has anyone ever climbed a rope ladder? Yes. We have a yes here. Great. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Uh, next slide. Now, that particular hide is on what we know as the crested hawk. We heard that... Uh, and I've filmed this for David's, uh, one of his series. We heard that this hawk mimicked frogs and then homed in on them when the frog responded with a call. And I thought, wow, what a story this is. And so we went out and we found a nest of one of these hawks and uh, built the hide and we thought, wow, we can see from the hide level where it's going to collect the frogs and we should be able to film it. We never did get that sequence. But we did, next slide please. We did get them bringing back the frogs. Uh, and I was sorry, but what transpired out of that, you have to be an absolute opportunist. We noticed that the, uh, one of the birds, and there were originally three, dominated the whole food source. And what we ended up filming was an example of what's known as siblicide, whereas the young sibling deprives its sister or brother from eating any of the food. It dominates the food that's brought in, and so they just die. And that is known as siblicide. Next slide. This is what I'm talking about with deforestation, one of my big concerns on this planet, and increasing human, human population, as I mentioned earlier, is a major problem for all of us. And I think down the track, we probably need to think about uh, decreasing our human population, whether it's a cultural thing or a religious thing or what. And I think governments, uh, need to start thinking about this because we are killing our planet. Next slide. The results of deforestation for all wildlife is just immense at the moment. And I think this tells a very graphic story. Next slide. This is a koala in Australia. And you can see the amount of land that has just been cleared. And this is for the, the timber and the, the furniture industry and building houses. And, uh, and at the end of the day, it's all about the money. You know? It's all about employment and money. And meanwhile, our environments are going to the dogs. Next slide. By doing that, we're also depriving animals of their nesting holes. And... Parrots in Australia are on the decline because of this. Next slide. Now, 
This is a little bird called a crimson chat, which is out in desert country. And all the stuff in the main, there's no trees out in the desert, but it's all low-growing bushes and shrubby. Next slide. Feral cats. We have, in Australia, 26 million feral cats decimating our wildlife. Next slide. And we have uh, an estimated now 10 million foxes introduced into the country whose evolution never had those sort of predators. And between the cats and the foxes, they are wiping out uh, just countless millions. In fact, I've seen uh, dissections of uh, foxes and cats where their stomach is full of crickets and grasshoppers. Every night, you and I go to sleep, 75 million native species go missing. And that's because we, as humans, have introduced these animals into an environment that was never evolved to have these sort of predators. Next slide. Now, the illegal bird trade is uh, something I'm uh, against and very passionate about preventing. Now, what happens in Australia is people come from overseas, they're taken out into the bush, they raid the nests of these animals and they smuggle the eggs back overseas. And they are reducing the population. The illegal bird trade is just massive in the world. And we all need to be concerned about this and report any incidences you know about. Next slide. This is a big winner. In the course of evolution, evolution does amazing things. And in this case, this is one of the rarest photographs on the planet and it was done six months ago. This is a pink cockatoo. Now, what's happened in this case, what nature does occasionally is to produce what's known as a genetic split. It's not a cross with another animal. Next slide. It's an individual that, that has a, a different genetic structure to produce the pink. These, this is a flock of white cockatoos and it's the only one that is this genetic split. And it's an absolutely fabulous animal. Next slide. You're looking at probably one of the rarest photographs on Earth because genetic splits aren't common at all. So what happens is in the evolutionary trend, uh, it occasionally produces an animal with a difference. And if it helps that species uh, to a better life uh, or some advantage uh, that the others haven't got, it will carry on. And down the track, who knows, we might see pink cockatoos. It could be the start of a, a subspecies. But what a, what a fabulous bird. Next slide. And the next slide. We don't realise when we produce all this stuff. Now, migratory birds fly into tall buildings on their migratory route because they migrate day and night and they fly straight into, I know in New York, they find dozens and dozens of dead birds at the bottom of the tall buildings. They weren't there when the birds did the migratory route, but they have a, a genetic implant as to the route they fly and at what height they fly. And suddenly you've got these obstacles up there in a place that they were never ever used to. And they can't just change overnight. They can't avoid the buildings. So they find all these dead birds at the top of the skyscrapers. Next slide. That was a quail, that previous shot that had got caught in a barbed wire fence we put up there. Other birds get caught in uh, netting. And uh, next slide. Dead birds. And this is what I'm talking about in the drought in Australia at the moment. Uh, just dozens and dozens of dead birds. Now, the big birds... I've noticed out there, can fly out of the, air, the drought area and head towards the coast where it's a little bit uh, greener and there's more water availability. 
having no water out there, the small birds can't fly out. But in addition to that, there's no insects to feed them on. Insects can't breed unless there's water. And so just literally hundreds of thousands of dead birds in some areas. Next slide. Plastics. We don't realise that birds swallow the plastics that we throw away. It gets wound up in their gut, gut because it doesn't digest. And so what happens ultimately, it kills them. Next. Oil spills. You've all heard of oil spills. But it's, oil is very hard to contain and they try and contain it but not before it's done a lot of damage. Next slide. Penguins. Whatever the species is that settles on water that's got an oil spill, it's doomed for them. They can't clean it off. Uh, and the oil companies won't stop because it's all about the money, isn't it? The money thing in, in this world is our Achilles heel. Everything is about the money. And if you want to follow the money trail, it leads you to the basic problems. And I think the money trail on this earth always leads and, and is a dangerous thing. And down the track, I perceive getting rid of our money system and that mentality. It's the profit motive. Next slide. This is uh, the Fukushima thing taken from space uh, with infrared uh, that's spilling out of there. Next slide. This is on the west coast of America and this is what I talked about earlier about Fukushima. It is disastrous. I've got other pictures I could have put in here with uh, hundreds of thousands of dead starfish. Uh, now... If it's killing the phytoplankton and starfish and things like that, there's crucial life in the sea that's just now dying out. Next slide. Listen. The earth is crying. And why is it crying? It's what we're doing to it. And I did this shot. I travelled out into the desert country and I took one little bit of green grass with me and planted it alongside. <clears throat> That's what I would call hope. And it's up to each and every one of us to carry on that hope because we are not being very kind to the earth and it is crying and we need to do something about it. So I intend to do something about it. Next slide. I have devised, I've worked for the last 12 years on providing a solution and to alter the conscious thinking on this earth. Now it's long been said that if you can change the conscious thinking on this earth by 13%, you've won. I'm aiming to go higher just to be on the safe side of things. And what do I mean by conscious thinking? There's a mentality out there, there's big cover-ups. Mainstream media is one of the biggest faults. They prefer to present the sensational side of the news uh, to keep people's interest up while they don't report the real truth of what's happening on this planet. Same with the papers. It's all about sensationalism. And that's something we need to deal with. So I devised a way, who are the real heroes on this planet? Anyone take a guess? Who are the real heroes? Come on. It's singers and musicians and entertainers, right? Who has, who has the biggest followings on this earth? Do you each have a singer you like or a musician you like? Eh? That's what we're going to tap into with Symphony of the Earth. Symphony of the Earth is a two and a half hour blockbuster musical but I'm taking it a step further. I'm going to introduce in Symphony of the Earth something the world has never heard, and it's animal music. Travelling the world for Attenborough, 
I've heard animal sounds that imitate any instrument you've ever heard in, a, say, a conventional symphony orchestra. The four main uh, styles of sound out there, which is brass, string, woodwind and percussion. They're all out there in the wild, so I'm sending about 20 odd wildlife cameramen all over the world to film animals making sounds. And those sounds will be given to the uh, composers and they will be integrating them into the music or they will be also stand alone so that you will hear animals making music in a way you have never heard music before. And it's a big ask, but it can be done, and I'm going to do it. Now, if I put pink in there, anyone, everyone familiar with pink? To film her, I'm going to put her out among the flamingos, and she's singing this song that says... And she doesn't like politicians. I haven't got a lot of respect for them either. She's singing a song that says, we need to pick politicians as green as grass, not as pink as my ass." <laughs> uh, humour is also the way to the soul. And there is a lot of humour in, in Symphony of the Earth. There is a laughing sequence. And... And you'd uh, let me hear the hornbill laughing today, and that's going in the laughing sequence in Symphony of the Earth, along with hyenas and kookaburras and other things. You'll hear animals laughing, and I bet you by the time we finish this sequence, you'll be in literally tears of laughter. You won't be able to contain yourself. Uh, there are emotional sequences. I've written a... a a five-page poem that I want Joanna Lumney and Morgan Freeman to deliver, and it sends a, a rather serious message to all human beings on this earth. Uh, some of the other sequences in there, I want ABBA in there. You'd be all... And I'm trying to pick those groups and cover all genres of music, from what young people like you like to what older people of my age like and it's a cross section and that's why it's a two and a half hour blockbuster and all the messages will be in the lyrics of song sung by your heroes and that's the whole concept of symphony and what I'm trying to do if I can change with your help the conscious thinking on this planet we've won we've got to make people rethink what we're doing. Mm -hmm.